you through some of the thought processes I have when I deal with somebody with tremor that is a bit unusual and try to classify it. And then here and there, there will be some mention of neurosurgery, and uh, there will be hopefully time for questions at, at the end. Uh, so th there's, a, there's a couple things I'll blast through, which is uh, how do we assess tremor, and this is one of the things we do. Um, we have people draw these cursive letter E's across the page, uh, mainly because if they're right-handed, they don't know how to write with their left hand very well. So that's uh, the kind of thing we do, and that looks fairly smooth. It doesn't show a lot of tremor and we switch this to his right hand, he immediately develops this uh, shaky oscillation, which interferes with his ability to write. The rest of the exam is essentially normal. There was really nothing else uh, on, on exam other than uh, that uh, brain abnormality, perhaps. I unfortunately don't have a uh, video of the case two, uh, which was this leg-only tremor. It was a pretty dramatic tremor. It was, it was, it was fairly uh, constant, but uh, uh, only during rest, and when he moved the le leg, it would it would abate for a while and then reemerge. Uh, so I don't have that one, unfortunately. Uh, I have no disclosures, and I, I am going to talk about medications that are used off label. So the first thing when we look at referrals for tremor is, um, you know, what is it? Uh, as movement disorders, we try to classify things. Tremor is this uh, oscillation of a body part, uh, but you know, it's, it turns out there's always exceptions to the rules. So you have these irregular tremors, and, and a good example of that is uh, cerebellar-associated uh, tremors, which characteristically have some pass pointing and things that throw in some irregularity. We still call those tremor. Uh, you also have regular non-tremor symptoms, like, like myoclonus. Uh, there's a syndrome, which I'll touch upon later, called palatomyoclonus, where the palate rhythmically moves up and down. The EMG bursts are short enough to classify it as myoclonus, but it's rhythmic, and so some people do call it a palatal tremor. And then you get these irregular non-tremors. This is a case referred to me for tremor, and it turns out to be a fasciculations, just of his pinky. And the diagnosis was uh, a neuromuscular condition. It turns out that he has a cervical radiculopathy presenting with just tremor. Uh, quick thing, this is just to illustrate the kind of things that we do when we look at tremor. Um, obviously, you try to provoke the tremor in some way. If someone has tremor when they play the harmonica, you're going to have them bring them the harmonica, have them play the, play the harmonica. But uh, the standard things we do is this uh, lift the object to your lips because it uh, functionally uh, has two roles. One, it tells us something about the ability to function. And second, it puts the limb at a mechanical disadvantage, having the arm out like this holding an object, and so it tends to enhance tremor. So we routinely have people pour water back and forth. We tell them not to actually drink the stuff. And then on the right there, besides the writing and drawing the spiral that you saw, we have the postural tremor here. You also observe it at rest. You observe it during gait. And then she's going to do this wing beating posture, which is similar to this in just a moment, similar to the uh, bringing the cup to the lips. So we're looking at the uh, movement kinetic tremor now, finger to nose. You can see she has a bit of tremor during action. And then that's the standard posture that we look for tremor. So then once you observe tremor, it's, it's you know, where physicians tend to be smart people and they always want to quantitate things. So there have been attempts throughout the uh, last century in trying to quantify tremor. On the right, Dr. Peterson in New York uh, devised this thing called a sphingmograph, uh, where you have the bottom of that contraption placed against the limb. Um, uh, pressure is transmitted to a membrane on the top, and the membrane is attached to a needle, which moves on a piece of smoked paper, which is moving along through a clockwork pendulum mechanism. And there are samples of his tracings uh, that, that were presented at the the American Neurologic Association, and the, the frequency of tremors that he got were comparable to what we get today. Um, on, the, on the right here, I have some ways that we might want to uh, sample tremor here in the clinic. Um, the Vibration is an iPhone app that I've used on and off for about a year and a half, and uh, this one just came out, Tremor Tracer, which I actually haven't gone out and, and bought. Uh, but in general, you know, these things are ancillary to the neurologic exam. You're going to depend a lot more on your exam, and these things can help track uh, uh, tremor over time. 
Uh, one thing we do do a couple times a year is uh, record tremor with uh, EMG, and we also have an accelerometer that you can rig up and, and record accelerometry movement of the limb along with the EMG. And, you know, again, it's an extension of the neurologic exam, so there's only really one major indication to, to go out and, and do this kind of study, and that's to uh, look at orthostatic tremor, a particularly interesting type of tremor. Well, and you'll see why in, in a moment. But it's another way that we'll sometimes document tremor or show people what their tremor looks like on, on the screen like that. So then the, the meat of what I want to talk about is how you classify tremor. When you, you read these uh, texts on tremor, there's many different ways that they're classified. And the, the first, and, and the, this, is a, this is a listing of things I'll talk about. There's classification by frequency. Frequency is probably the most salient thing you see when you, when you see somebody with tremor or you record uh, a, a tremor. And amplitude kind of goes along with that. And that's usually what you see as the first sentence describing tremor. It's this frequency, it's this amplitude, and so on. Um, I favor the classification by phenomenology, which I have a table, which I'll show you. And then there's uh, what generates the tremor? What are the mechanisms of tremor? And that probably is most relevant to neurosurgeons uh, because you're interested in when the oscillations are centrally located and whether you can do anything to abort the tremor. And then you can also classify by body parts. There's a few um, uh, fairly interesting tremors that involve the tongue or involve the head or involve the uh, leg. Um, so let's go into these. So this um, is kind of a poorly reproduced table classifying tremor by frequency. There, there's a number of these attempts over the years. Um, it's fine that the table's kind of obscure because I don't find it particularly useful. Uh, as you'll see, when you look at tremor frequency, and here is a list of tremors in some kind of random order. They're, they're kind of uh, random. And here is uh, a distribution of what frequencies uh, each one produces. And you can see they all overlap substantially which is why they're not terribly helpful. The one exception is this guy here. This is orthostatic tremor. It has a particularly high frequency above 18 hertz. It's such a high frequency that you may not see it, and that's the only indication we use EMG for, is to detect that particular tremor. This side is a little more interesting. This is activation by, and that uh, suggests uh, in the presentations I've been given uh, that Colin gave, is what activates the tremor, and they have rest, posture, and goal-directed movements. And that really is what I would emphasize is the take-home message uh, for the talk. Uh, this is the classification that I've come up with over the years and how to put the uh, language together. And if there's anything to uh, learn from this talk is th this is how you want to communicate uh, and describe your tremors. I've put in uh, large cap letters the four major categories of terminology that are most helpful. And the first distinction is really between rest tremor, which is a tremor in a body part that is not activated with EMG and su fully supported against gravity, versus an action tremor, which is tremor during any kind of voluntary EMG activity. The, you then divide action tremors into a postural tremor, which is when you hold the arm out steady, versus a kinetic tremor when the limb or the body part is moving. Kinetic tremor is divided into simple kinetic tremor, which is just tremor like you saw in the lady who was doing the uh, water pouring. She had tremor throughout her action, with finger to nose, posture holding, pouring water. So that's non-goal directed. It doesn't matter what the goal is. As long as the limb is in motion, it would classify as a simple kinetic tremor. This contrasts with intention tremor, uh, which is another big category, which is tremor during goal-directed movement. In this case, the tremor increases during pursuit of a goal. And when you get closer to the goal, the tremor increases in amplitude, and this characteristically occurs with cerebellar-type lesions. 